our Starbase videos for uh, eh, giving a little bit of education during these downtimes. Just a little bit of background information about our program is uh, we here on Goodfellow Air Force Base are part of the Starbase program where we teach students, uh, particularly fifth grade students, about science, technology, engineering, and math. So these are STEM related activities. So due to the recent COVID-19 outbreak, uh, none reported here so far, uh, we are going to be talking just a little bit about some science, technology, engineering, and math activities. That way, all of our kiddos who are stuck at home, unfortunately, uh, maybe have something fun to do and learn while they are away from school and their extended spring break. So today, uh, I guess introduction to myself, uh, my name is Mr. Maddox. I am one of the teachers here at Starbase. And some of you have probably seen us around town. We do also have a studio out at the Chicken Farm Art Center called the Mad Mouse Zudio, uh, where we have quite a few of our animals. And so if you do not know us, uh, we have a lot of pets. And so I actually brought a few of those here today to talk just a little bit about creepy crawly diversity. And I know what you're saying. Ugh, gross, creepy crawlies. Well, a lot of people feel that way, but hopefully, after maybe showing you some interesting animals, uh, maybe you'll have a slightly different tune. And we also have a nice activity that you kiddos at home can do, uh, especially if you happen to like creepy crawlies. And so today we're going to be starting off with science, the S in STEM. And we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the biology aspect. And so let's take a look at some of the animals that we brought here. Now, everything that I brought today is an arthropod. It is an animal that has an exoskeleton, so no bones on the inside, just kind of a crunchy outside, and jointed appendages. And so we have a lot of different arthropods, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. And kind of the theme for today is legs. Legs will really kind of help tell us what kind of creepy crawly we're dealing with, because believe it or not, not everything is a bug. And so, that being said, I think we are going to start with the insects. And so I care to wager that most every person knows how many legs an insect has. And that is, wait for my door at the moment, Explorer. That's right, six, six legs. And so I'm going to show you one of our creepy crawlies that we happen to raise. Uh, I will probably bring this one a little bit closer to the camera for you to see. Unless you're going to help me with that. <laughs> yeah, I can. So, our first animal we have right here is a Madagascar hissing cockroach. And these guys are a little bit different from the cockroaches we have around here. One, uh, they're big, uh, they do not have wings, and if you make them angry or uncomfortable, they might let out a hissing sound. But, unfortunately, I guess they have some camera shyness here because they don't want to hiss for us. But if I turn this girl over right here, and it is a girl, I'll show you, you can tell the difference in a second, you'll notice there are six legs. And so these guys are harmless. They can't really bite you. Uh, here, for comparison, is a boy. And how you can tell is that the boy has horns, has really pronounced horns right here on the top by my finger. They want to stand still, which they do not. And so, oh, you might be able to hear some hissing noises. Oh, nope, as soon as the camera's on them. So these are our insects. These guys have six legs. Now, for our next group, we're going to talk a little bit more. If you're interested in studying insects, then entomology is the field you would go into. But now we're going to get to the arachnids. And so arachnids have, door of the, door of the explorer moment, uh, that's right, eight legs. And so I'm going to show you several different arachnids. Now, only two of the one, actually only one of the ones I brought for you today, uh, you can find in this area, in San Angelo. The rest of them are going to be from different places in the world. So I guess I'll start with the one that most everyone is familiar with, and that is the tarantula. And so I'm going to see if I can get this girl to crawl on me. This is what is called a Chaco Golden Knee Tarantula. And so this is a tarantula that's in the genus Gramostola. Uh, these girls can live a very long time. But you'll notice she does, in fact, have eight legs. And the rule of thumb for counting legs on an arachnid is you always want to start at the back. Four, three, two, one. And then you get these little guys up front, which are called pedipalps. In spiders, they look like an extra set of legs, but they use them to kind of move things around. And so in the other arachnids, I'll show you what they look a little bit different. So that's our nice tarantula. Back in, girl. 
Our next one, which uh, I probably won't be picking up, is one that you may have already seen on our picture that we posted earlier. And so, if I could get you to move just a smidge closer, we have an Asian forest scorpion here in the back corner next to some of her food. And so, these are once again arachnids, but they're not spiders, completely different kind of arachnid. And the easiest way to tell a scorpion, besides the fact it has pinchers and a uh, stinger on the back, is that all true scorpions fluoresce under black light. And so I can take this light, and uh, it's very easy to see where the scorpion is at. You'll notice the little cockroach over here doesn't really fluoresce so much, but that scorpion lights right up. And all scorpions can do this and i say true scorpions because i'm about to show you one that is called a scorpion but it's not actually a scorpion and so our last little arachnid that i brought for you is what is called a vinegar rune and so this is one that uh, some people have probably seen around here they're pretty uncommon in san angelo but if you go around san angelo you can probably find them and so this is called a whip scorpion because instead of having that long tail in the back with a stinger on the end, it just has this flagella or this whip. And all that does is it's basically like a cane. They feel around with it. Arachnids have terrible eyesight for the most part. And so they use that to feel and move around. You can also notice she's doing that with her front legs as well. And so the front legs in this group are very antenniform. They're long and skinny. They can feel around with them. And that's good because uh, they're kind of lost without those. And so once again, how you count those legs is you go from the back, four, three, two, and then one. And then the pedipalps in this group, they look almost like a scorpion's pinchers, but they're very primitive, so they don't really pinch too much. But why they're called vinegaroons is because from this rear end right here, they can spray concentrated acetic acid or vinegar. And so if that gets into your eyes or your nose, uh, that's going to be kind of painful. If it gets on your skin, it's not so bad. But if I take this black light and I put it over, you'll notice it does not fluoresce. There is no indication of this being a true scorpion. But they are sometimes called scorpions. All righty. For our last little group that we brought here, we are going to be talking about myriapods. And so myriapoda literally translates to a myriad of feet or legs. And so these are going to be the groups that have a lot more legs than normal. I'm going to start with the friendly one and then we'll move to the not so friendly one, which both of these are found in Texas. So we have the gold ornate desert millipede here. Uh, millipedes are very friendly. Uh, I guess I should say maybe not friendly as so much they won't bite you. But what they have are quite a few legs, not quite a million, but the rule of thumb here is for each one of these little segments you see, each of these lines, there should be two sets of legs. So they are diplopods. For every segment, two sets of legs. These guys like to eat fruits and veggies and just pooped on my lid there. Uh, they like to kind of just nibble on anything that's lying around. They're scavengers. And so if you go to certain parts of Texas after a good rain, like the one we've had these past weeks, uh, these guys will be all over the place. You can find them by the thousands out there. And so, really the only way these guys can protect themselves is they'll roll up in a ball when they get scared. Uh, this one's used to being held so it doesn't roll up so much. And they release a really bad smell. So if you ever have a chance, just to take kind of a whiff out of a millipede. They just have a really earthy smell to them. Hmm, weird. So, that is our millipede. Our next one that we're going to have is one that especially for you kiddos out there, be very careful. Uh, so this is going to be a giant desert centipede. They are found here in San Angelo, and depending on where you find them, they look different. But I went ahead and brought the one that you would find here in San Angelo. So first thing you're going to notice is that, uh, well, not as many legs. Still quite a few, but not as many as the millipede. And so these guys, chylopods, they have one pair of legs per segment. Now, this one doesn't seem to be doing very much, but these are active hunters. And so they have in the very front, uh, besides their antenna, they actually don't bite you. What they do is they have a special pair of modified legs called forcipules, their very first pair of legs. They've turned them sideways, and now they inject venom with them. And so, bite or sting, it doesn't matter. It hurts all the same. Uh, this is not a fatal bite for humans, but it is an extremely painful one. So if you see one of these, I would not suggest picking them up. And while it is not very active right now, I will give it just a little bit of a poke, 
and maybe we can see it kind of come to life here. These are active hunters. They will eat anything they can catch. You can often find them crawling along rock walls and things of that nature. He's going to go hide back in his hole. That's where they usually spend the day, as they burrow down or they burrow into rock cuts, things of that nature. All righty, so that, those are just a few of the creepy crawlies that uh, we have in this area. Some of them are not found here, but we do have tarantulas and we do have scorpions. And so, what I'm going to show you guys today is I'm going to show you a little activity where you will be able to make your own terrarium. And whether you decide to keep animals in it is probably up to you and uh, probably your parents as well. So I'm going to show you just a little quick, easy way to make some fun desktop terrariums. That way you can always have something to look at while you're waiting eagerly to go back to school. So, all of the supplies, with the exception of the container itself, I just walked right outside and I was able to get. And so, the first thing you should do is you should find a container that you really like. I have two that we can choose from here today. I have a plastic one, which as long as it has a lid, it's good. And I have a mason jar as well. And so really the key here, especially if you decide to keep anything alive in it, is to make sure it has a lid. That will also help with some of our humidity issues. And so a couple things that I went outside and collected. I have some sticks. I got some nice pebbles or rocks on the ground. Small ones are nice for this. I found some moss wherever it's kind of damp, like around drainage gutters or anywhere that's in the shade. You can usually find some nice moss. And then, of course, I got some dirt. And so a little bit earlier today, I set up this one kind of what a completed one is going to look like. And so you can really get kind of creative with what you want it to look like. I tried to put some nice sticks in there that look like a big dead tree, try to make a little forest scape or something of that nature. And so we're gonna be making something like that. And ideally, once you get it set up, it should need very little care. And you should be able to have this moss or any other plants that are small grow for quite some time. And so, to start off, we're gonna pick a container. I think I'm gonna pick the mason jar here. And the very first thing is we need ventilation in here. And so what you want to do is I'm going to start by taking a sharp object. Uh, I would find a push pin or a thumbtack of that nature. And I'm going to poke just one hole right in the center there. Your hole should not be too large, but it should be a nice, just simple little hole. After you've taken the hole, you're going to take your lid off and make sure you've rinsed your jar out. When you're collecting your supplies, please make sure that uh, there's no chemicals or anything on them. You can give them a good rinse just to make sure, because if you do want to put any kind of living things in here, well, they do not like poisons, pesticides, things of that nature. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take some of our pebbles, and we're going to make sure that we have a nice layer of those on the bottom. Your parents will really like it if you uh, use a tray like I am. So I'm going to make sure, I'm going to go a little generous on my pebbles here, just to prove a point. This will be our drainage layer. This is going to help retain water as well as to make sure it's not sitting and drowning your moss. After you have a nice little layer of pebbles there, now you're going to add a little bit of dirt. And I'm going to make a mess to do this, but that's okay. Do a nice layer of dirt. Give it a nice shake, make sure it's nice and flat. So now we have some dirt and we have some drainage here. The next thing you're going to add is your moss. And so I'm going to take a little bit of this moss. I don't think I want to use all of it. So I'm going to go ahead and just take a little piece of it. And I'm going to try to nestle it in there and just press it down oh so gently there, right in the front. And it looks like maybe I do have a little bit more room than I thought. So I'm going to try to put a little bit more in there. Alrighty, so now I have a nice, nice solid layer of moss right on the top there. And if you have any kind of bare spots, this is where you're going to try to put any kind of sticks or if you find any really cool rocks on the ground, uh, this is where you're going to try to fit those in just to make it look nice and complete. So I'm going to pick a stick out of here that looks kind of like a dead tree. Let's see, I think I like, I think I like this one. And I'm going to nestle it right in that corner where... 
that blank spot was at. So now I have just a little bit of decoration in here. If you also have any other cool rocks, you can set a few pebbles on there, just make it really stand out. And the next part is we're gonna add some living things here. And parents, don't worry, I'm gonna pick one that you guys are, everyone's familiar with, not too scary. And that's gonna be isopods. Now, most of you guys call these roly-polies or pill bugs, things of that nature. And so mine are hidden in here. So I'm gonna use a big one to show you what these guys might look like. I've got a nice brown one and a nice blue one here. So for an isopod or a roly-poly, there are several different species you can choose. I personally really like the ones that roll up into a ball. It's an armadillidium. I think they're a little bit hardier, but you pick whichever ones you can find. And I guess some fun information about these guys is they will eat just about anything. I like throwing fish flakes into mine. You can put any little pieces of veggies in there. They will eat just about anything. But if you do decide to put roly-polies in here, make sure they do have food. Otherwise, they're going to eat all your moss. And so these are also not insects. One, you'll notice they have a lot more legs on the bottom. Not quite a million, but these are crustaceans. So isopods have gills, which means they need to stay humid. So every now and then, you will have to spray just a little bit of water in there. And that's why we only poked one hole in here, because maintaining the humidity is key, not only for the roly-polies, but for the moss. If it dries up, well, that's the end of your animals in there. And so we're just going to have our little hole. I'm going to dig out a couple nice little roly-polies that I collected earlier. There's one. Looks like a little, like a little ball. Drop him in there. Let's see, mine like to burrow, so don't be too discouraged if you can't find your roly-polies, because they do like to hide, but if you put your food on the top, oh, here's a big one. This is one of our flat scabers, so this isn't the one that rolls up into a ball, but they definitely are a little bit faster. Let's see, let's see. And they can coexist, that's not really an issue for these guys, as long as there's plenty of food. I guess I got mostly big scabers in here. So the key is you do not want to put very many in here. You want to create a tiny, mostly self-contained ecosystem. So the last thing you want to do is put too many in there. Otherwise, there won't be enough food for everybody. So we're just going to put one or two in there. I'm going to wipe away a little bit of the dirt on the glass just to make sure we can actually see. Once you put your water in here, that'll kind of clean everything up for you. And now, once you seal it up with a lid on top, you should have a little self-contained ecosystem. Everything will kind of settle in place. You just have to make sure you really add water and maybe throw in a little piece of vegetables or anything, some rotten leaves, whatever you might find. So this one is very simple. You guys can find whichever jars you like and make it as complex as you really want to. Uh, and a really easy one to do is doing a desert one, but I didn't have any succulents on me, but you can plant a desert one very easily. So I hope that if you really enjoy animals, maybe you'll try making one of these and you can tell us if yours is still living after X amount of weeks, we're really interested in how long you can keep these alive for, which if you give them what they need, they should go on indefinitely. So thank you. That is the end of our presentation here. I hope you enjoyed some of the creepy crawlies we had, and hopefully you can make a nice terrarium. If you do happen to make a terrarium, please post a picture of it under this video or on our page. We would love to see what you guys are doing, and we hope that you guys will join us for our next video. Thank you again. Bye-bye, guys.